Hello everybody, if this is your first time tuning into my channel, my name is Eli. If uh, you've seen my other videos, uh, thank you for coming back and thank you for supporting my channel. If you like what you see in this video, click subscribe because I've got plenty more to come. Uh, in this video, we're going to be going into depth on one of my most recent projects, and that project is the chain vase. I'm going to show you how to create this pattern of inlay inside of your uh, turned project and this the, the the idea behind this is to not interrupt the grain of the wood yet create a pattern running around um, whatever project it is that you're working on. The project that we're going to actually do in this video is going to be this miniature vase that you see here and the, this vase can be displayed with or without the finial. It looks great either way. Some people aren't into finials and that's fine. I just kind of as an afterthought decided to make a cap for it. Uh, no particular reason. Uh, before we get in started in on that, I want to talk about um, a Patreon account that I am working on setting up. Um, what I want to do is create an account where I can go way more into depth on many of my projects, both old projects and new projects. I want to cover things like the finishes that I do, um, some of the older projects that I did like the, um, the herringbone pattern and so on. But I really want to get in depth and kind of show you guys from point A to, to point B how to create these projects, kind of how to work through issues that you may run into. I've got some projects in the works right now that are really far outside of the box and um, they're very time consuming, very detailed, and they require a lot of very specific and um, tedious processes. But the end results of those projects are gonna be amazing and a lot of those are already in the works. I already know what they look like and I can tell you that they're just stunning projects. So if you're interested in something like that, comment below on things that you would like to see in my videos, um, at topics that you might want me to cover, or maybe things that you don't want me to cover, I don't know. But um, your input is important to me. So uh, in the comments below, let me know what you think about a Patreon account and getting a more in-depth look at the type of work that I do. Anyways, um, without holding you up too much longer, let's go ahead and get started on this vase and see if we can uh, get something done here. Because I use a Harbor Freight lathe, it's not quite as accurate as some of the nicer, bigger lathes. So I always double check to make sure everything is lined up properly before I do any project. Uh, and I've adjusted this one just a couple days ago. I still check it. Everything's fine. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on with this project. But um, the first thing that we want to do is turn our shape down to its rough size. We want to leave it slightly oversized by maybe an eighth of an inch, three sixteenths of an inch overall. Um, and we'll kind of get to that later. But what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to turn a tendon on the end of it, um, which is going to be the bottom side. And uh, that's so that I can actually put it in my chuck here. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and then we're going to move on from there. So as you can see, I've turned down the rough shape of the vessel that I'm going to be doing. And again, it's a sixteenth of an inch oversized. I actually had filmed me starting to turn this thing and I ended up knocking my camera over. So um, I didn't film that whole process. I think most of you can uh, do the rough turning on this without a whole lot of instruction. And it was just safer uh, for me to do it without the camera in the way of the tools that I was using. So I kind of just gave up on trying to film turning this part of it. Um, so now that I've got the rough shape um, set up, we're going to go ahead and move on to the part where we put the rings in this. And uh, the first part that I have to show you is how to actually make the tool that we're going to use to cut the rings and then we're going to move on to cutting the rings. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to make the tool that's going to cut the grooves for my rings. Um, what I have here is a piece of steel tubing that I got from Lowe's. It's a half inch outside diameter. Um, and the wall thickness is way too thick. 
So um, I've got to make this into what I want it to be. Now, I've done a lot of looking online for um, stainless steel tubing or metal tubing that has the right diameter with the proper wall thickness and all of that. And it's almost impossible to find. I can always find the right outside diameter, but the wall thickness is either too thick or too thin. Um, and you can do this with any size ring. Um, you would just follow the same process. Um, so this, I, I, again, I bought this at Lowe's. This is a piece of half inch outside diameter steel tubing. Now the problem that I have with this steel tubing is that it is not seamless, which means when they manufacture this, where the seam is at, um, there's a little lump right there. You can kind of feel it, and if you put your calipers on it and you kind of rotate it in your calipers, you'll see where the bump is in, um, in your tubing. Now, seamless tubing is a lot better about that, but I just didn't have access to it. So what I did was I cut a four inch section of it off and I chucked it into my lathe. And if I zoom in here, you can see where I've kind of, let me turn the lathe on. You can see a little bit of a wobble back here, but up here it's true, it's run fairly smooth. There's no real issues with it. And you can see that I, I did kind of leave a little bit through here. You can see where my, um, my tool didn't touch it. Now how I trued it up was, I used my hollowing tool with a carbide bit on it. And yes, that will we'll cut steel, no problem. You want to make sure that you are wearing safety glasses. And um, I kept my, my lathe at low speed. And I just slowly moved across it. And it takes off like a ten thousandth of an inch each pass. It doesn't take off much at all. So it actually took me about 20 minutes to get this little two inch section here. Um, cut down to the, I mean, to get it kind of trued up so that the, so that it's not kind of egg shaped. And uh, again, you just want to be really careful doing this. Um, it's this is act, this is steel. It's non-ferrous. And uh, I always use when I, whenever I turn a piece of steel on there, which is very rarely, and when I'm turning the outside, I always use an old carbide bit. I don't want to break out a brand new one. I'm just going to destroy it. And uh, this the. The, though I got a little chip in this one right there from doing this but um, this one's actually a, a, a fairly new bit but it's ready to be rotated if you know what I mean so I'm using kind of the the dull side and it doesn't really do anything bad to it you can still sharpen this bit after you do this and it'll be good to go if you sharpen your carbide bit um, so what I'm gonna do now now that I've got the outside portion of this kind of trued up um, this is just another little section of it that I, I cut off. As you can see that that wall thickness is about an eighth of an inch too thick and you can see right here the seam on the inside. So like I said, this is not seamless tubing. So what I ended up doing was I know that the outside diameter of my tube is a half of an inch and I wanna create um, a 32nd of an inch wall thickness. So all I really had to do was um, kind of measure the inside diameter and then get a drill bit that when I run it through this tubing is going to cut it out to where my wall thickness is a 32nd of an inch thick. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and set up to do that. And, and you want to make sure that um, your tail stock, sorry, got my finger in the way of the camera, that your tail stock is dead center on this because you're going down to, like I said, a 32nd of an inch wall thickness, which is not that much. So if you're off center, you're just going to destroy your piece. Um, you could break your bit, things could go flying. When you do this, make sure you wear a, um, a face shield, and I always stand kind of back away from it. That way, if anything breaks, it flies this way. It flies um, out towards the shop and not back towards me, and I've got a face shield on anyways to kind of prevent that. So I'm going to set up to drill this hole real quick. So I'm going to pause this video, set it up, and then we're going to come back and start drilling this hole and see what happens. Okay, so I'm all set up to drill a hole. I'm going to get kind of close in here. Um, you can see that my drill bit is not actually touching the um, steel tubing. It's off of it, just a hair. And we're only going to cut into this tubing. Um, I've got about an inch and a half here. I don't need to cut into it any further than that. 
the wall thicknesses of most bowls, if you want the rings to show through the wall, is only going to be about a half of an inch. So drilling this into an inch and a half, the only thing that that really does is it allows me some some room to kind of file these teeth and sharpen them for a little while before I before I run out of a bit here. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the lathe on. I'm keeping it on slow speed, and I'm going to kind of drill this hole out um, really slow. Now I am drilling this and filming this um, one with one hand and one with the other. So I'm going to go kind of slow and keep the camera as still as I can. But hopefully you'll get the point of what I'm doing here. Okay, so obviously this metal gets pretty hot when you're drilling it out, and that's partially because the wall is so thin once you um, kind of run your drill bit through there. Now this is a brand new drill bit. It came out of the package right before I drilled this thing. And uh, I did kind of sharpen it up a little bit, even though it's a brand new drill bit. Most drill bits will do just fine, but I like to make sure that they're um, super sharp. So I'm not going to touch this quite yet. It's pretty hot. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause this video, wait for it to cool down, then I'm going to take it out of here and we're going to measure the wall thickness and see if we are where we want to be. Okay, so my piece has cooled down and I took it out of the, um, I took it out of the lathe. You can see it got, um, it got pretty hot while I was drilling it. It kind of changed colors, but that doesn't really affect it, um, at all. So what I want to do at this point is see if my wall thickness is um, where I need it to be. So I'm going to measure the veneer that I'm going to be using and hopefully you guys can see that the veneer is at uh, 0 0.021 inches thick and you want to check your wall thickness on your piece um, and as you can see I'm at 0 0.021 inches thick. Now you want to measure with the tips of your calipers not with uh, the base here because the inside wall of your tube is round and if you measure with the wider part like watch I'll slide it down now it's measuring 0.345 because the outside points of your caliper are hitting the inside wall at a different spot so it's going to give you a thicker measurement so just make sure you use the tips of your calipers 
and uh, my tube is now the same wall thickness as my veneer 0 0.021 inches thick and you can do this to match any veneer thickness that you have you just have to make sure you have the corresponding drill bit um, to create the thickness of your veneer I actually think that this would have been easier to do if I was using a piece of solid bar stock versus um, a hollow piece of steel I think that um, and I haven't tried it so I'm just kind of taking a guess here um, with the the wall thickness I think that it was a little more wobbly not being um, a solid piece of steel but maybe somewhere down the road I'll try it uh, I'm I'm gonna keep on um, oh, bump the camera I'm gonna keep looking for um, seamless tube that can come that I can just order uh, with the right wall thickness I doubt I'm gonna find it so for now I'm gonna probably end up having to just make whatever tool um, I need in order to do it um, if I can find a tool manufacturer to produce these hole saws then that would be um, excellent so what I'm gonna do now is um, I'm gonna actually cut the teeth on here and um, what I'm gonna use to do that is I'm just gonna take this um, diamond wheel that I have for my rotary tool and uh, I'm just gonna cut little notches sorry I'm kind of out of the frame there I'm just gonna cut little notches all the way around and those notches are gonna be maybe I don't know no more than an eighth of an inch deep um, I'm probably not gonna do that on film I'm just let me just cut the notches and then I'll come back and show you what it looks like and we'll go from there okay so I went ahead and I cut the notches um, if I can get this camera to focus because they're kind of fine there let's see if I can get use my hand to get it in but you can see my notches are only a you know a few uh, maybe an eighth of an inch deep or a sixteenth of an inch deep something like that and I cut two notches these notches are about a quarter of an inch deep here and the reason that I cut these I only cut two they're across from each other the only reason I cut on um, these notches was this will kind of allow the dust um, to kind of move up into these notches and hopefully prevent the wood from burning a little bit and uh, what I'm going to do now, I, and you know, I just used my rotary tool to cut these notches. I went in by hand, boom, 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 boom. I did eight of them around the rim, and two of the eight were a quarter of an inch deep. Um, so what I'm going to do now, let me see if I can find it right here, is I have this um, sawtooth file. It's just a triangle file. I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to touch each of these teeth up. Now, uh, I'm not going to make them go to a point. And uh, I'll kind of get into that in a minute. Let me go ahead and file these, and then I'll I'll talk about why I don't take them to a point. And I'll show you what the finished product looks like after I file it. All right, so I have filed the teeth on this thing, and I'm going to show you um, what it looks like real quick. Um, you can see that I, I just went down in there, and I kind of filed each one of these teeth to um, into the shape of the file, which is just a little triangle. And you're going to probably be thinking well why doesn't he take those teeth to a sharp point well that's kind of what I'm going to talk about now as you can see I've got um, three different bits sitting here on this block of wood um, this is the one that I just made this was the original one this is the bit that I you actually used in order to cut the rings on the um, Wenge vase um, and this was the second bit that I made that I made after this one. It's made out of the same material as this. It's the same bar stock. I, I made it um, a few hours before I actually made this one because I wanted to do some experimenting with this thing and see if it was going to work right. So let me kind of walk you through the process on how I, I kind of came to all these conclusions here. Um, I had the idea to put these rings, as I've said before, into a into a wood turning probably about a year ago and uh, because I was working on other projects I had to keep setting it aside and I was kind of working through the thing in my head like how am I actually going to cut the ring does the slots for the rings and you know all that stuff that I'm sure you've kind of asked yourself already since you've seen um, since you've seen the piece how's that happen and um, I came to the conclusion that the only way that I can do it was it was with a hole saw so I started looking for um, pieces of metal tubing that would have the right 
wall thickness I couldn't find it so I got a little bit antsy and I decided to go to the hardware store and buy some of this brass tubing and give it a shot and see what would end up happening if I just used brass and it actually worked as you can see on the Wingate piece but this was extremely problematic for a lot of different reasons and I'm going to show you how I made it because some of you may only have access to or be comfortable with working um, with the um, brass. Now this brass tube is actually has a wall thickness that is exactly what I need. I didn't have to modify the brass tubing at all. It was exactly 0 0.021 inches thick. And uh, the outside diameter of this was 5 eighths of an inch with the proper wall thickness. So what I ended up doing was I bought some 3 quarter inch thick solid bar stock of brass, um, which you can see there. And, I, and you can see how I used it here. You can see the same outside color. And what I did was I chucked this into the lathe and I turned down a section of it. And this part here tapers. So it goes in easy and it starts to get harder and harder and harder. So originally I cut my piece, I put it on, um, and I pressed it on there like you would do a pen blank. And uh, it worked really well. Um, it, it's on there. You can't pull it off. In order to get it off, um, which I've had to do, you almost have to, you have to, you absolutely have to cut a slot here and then it'll, it'll pull off of your, um, your piece here. And this was just cut to fit inside of my drill press. Now, the issues that I ran into this, as you may guess, are, is that brass is really soft. So I was messing with the teeth here originally and, and I originally had cut the teeth pretty deep each tooth was about an eighth of an inch deep I filed them to a point like a regular saw would be or a regular hole saw and I went in to drill my first hole and every single one of the teeth just folded out it flattened out and that's because the metal is so soft so I was like darn this isn't gonna work um, so I started messing with the teeth and um, the number of teeth how deep they were, do I file them to a point? And um, what I ended up after, I don't know, five or six different tries on teeth configuration, and I, all of them were going to a point. Every, every single one of those configurations was going to a point, and they all failed. So on this one, what you can see is they're spaced about 3 sixteenths of an inch apart, and they're only about a sixteenth of an inch deep. And uh, the second I did this and I put it into the drill press, I didn't have any hopes for it. I pressed in and it drilled right through there. The teeth did not bend out. I had no issues whatsoever. Other than the fact that the metal is super soft and it kind of burns through the wood. You can see the, um, the black marks from it burning into the wood, which was not an issue. Even on the maple, even though it burned into the maple, once I set the veneer in there and then turned away the top layer, those burn marks kind of just disappeared so you can actually do this with brass but you have to keep your teeth short like you can see here and um i filed the teeth maybe every fourth or fifth hole and by file it i mean i just barely touched it like two swipes with the file and uh because it's just not going to stay sharp you know what i mean so you can drill probably five to ten holes with something like this and then then touch the the teeth up real quick and and keep going on with that process and this bit actually works really well other than the fact that it is brass and it's super soft so this was the original bit i then went through the same process with the steel bit um, this again is the same material as that I hollowed the inside of it out and as you can see I cut my teeth pretty deep on this one um, this was the fourth or fifth I, I'm having a hard time getting this thing to focus this was the fourth or fifth um, test try with the teeth and um, what ended up happening was pretty much exactly the same thing as that yes it's steel yes it's harder but you have to remember your your wall thickness is about twice as thick as a piece of aluminum foil. So they're not very strong. Even if and I, what I did with um, with this piece was I actually tried to harden the tips. I, I took out my acetylene torch, I heated it up hot, and I, I just quenched it in some uh, water, and the teeth broke off. 
so I was like, crap, well, I'm having the same issues with the teeth um, that I had on the brass. Now, this actually does cut a lot better. I'll show you a little one, a practice cut. This was one of my cuts here. It actually cuts a lot better um, than the brass does. The brass tends to get a little gummed up. I think it heats up really hot, so the the, the bit's kind of constantly expanding and contracting because it heats up really quick. Now this does heat up, but not quite as quick. And I've noticed that the expansion and contraction on it isn't quite as bad either. So after messing around with the teeth for quite a while, I came to the same conclusion that I came to with the brass. It's better to just not have actual teeth, but more like, see if I can get my finger in here or something, show you but more like actual little notches with flat spots at the end. And I've got these dust grooves here. And that's, that seems to be what works. I don't, uh, you know, uh, after messing with it for quite some time, and you can see all the pieces here, and there were quite a few failures on this. I ended up, uh, just dropped everything. But with the brass one, I ended up throwing away quite a bit of material. I, I think I bought four, four one-foot tubes and I went through three of them before I figured out how the teeth would work best. So what we're gonna do now is um, we're gonna take this piece, we're gonna chuck it in the drill press, and I'm going to show you a practice cut. And then we're gonna move on to talking about how to, act to drill the actual piece. And uh, there's a little bit of information that you need to know there. So um, let me move out to the drill press and we'll go from there. Okay, so I've got my freshly made um, hole saw bit chucked into my drill press. We're going to make a test cut. And uh, what I'm going to do is show you how well this one cuts. And then I'm going to really quickly switch into the brass one and just show you how the brass one cuts. Um, this one you will see will make a much nicer, smoother hole with less burning versus this one. But uh, you'll kind of just have to see for yourself. So I'm going to go ahead and make a test cut. And uh, we're going to go from there. probably see some smoke coming off of there because yes it does burn just a little bit you'll see that it's a little off color just you know it does it does burn a, a hair bit it gets hot in there part of that is because the dust doesn't have a way to escape as you're cutting but if you cut a, you know I have cut grooves in here to allow the um the dust to kind of go up in but you, you don't want to cut more than than two of those grooves in there which I actually have here. You can see one here and here. And I, sh I talked about that a little bit earlier. But um, what you wanna do is um, drill and then double check with your piece of veneer to make sure that your, um, that your wall thickness is correct. And that piece of veneer should slide in there tight. There's like no room for movement. It can come in and out. I mean, it's just the hole is slightly larger than what the veneer is, but you're talking about a thousandth of an inch, maybe. Um, it's a nice, tight, solid fit, and you get a perfect ring. Now, uh, let me go ahead and really quickly switch out to the brass one, just so you can kind of get an idea of the difference between um, the steel tube versus the brass tube. And again, the brass tube does work. It, it actually works just fine. But um, it burns through there um, versus cutting through there. Uh, get this thing set in here. Tighten. All right, and I'm gonna drill this hole directly next to the other hole that I drilled. It's, uh, so Let's 
so you can see the difference between the two this one was the first one that I drilled and obviously the second one that I drilled you can see how much more of a burn mark you get with a brass ring versus a steel ring so um, and the other issues with the brass like I said the you have to be very careful with it um, the teeth if you get the brass too hot even though you have small cut, ah, I just knocked the camera over sorry um, anyways even if you have small cut teeth like what you see in this brass ring if that bit gets too hot what happens is the dust gets wedged between the inside wall and the hole that you're cutting and it'll uh, cause the bit to spread out like this it'll kind of you know push down into your thing and it'll actually split the brass I know that because I did it several times so your hole drilling is gonna even though this will work just fine and you actually probably have more options as far as um, hole diameters when you go with brass then you do with steel unless you just go buy a bunch of solid steel bar stock and make these things um, but again I think steel is the way to go if you're patient enough to actually make the bit and like I said I've been in contact with a few tool companies to see if they would be interested in producing something like this in different diameters uh, we'll see what comes of that. Um, I don't think it's really that hard to make. Um, and what we're going to do now is um, we're going to move on to actually drilling holes into the actual piece that we're going to be inlaying. And we're going to kind of go over some information on what the best way to do that is. So let me set up for that and then we'll get right back into it. So the pieces we're going to be putting our inlay rings in or whatever you want to call them, your chain your chain links um, that's gonna be for me this piece and um, I've already kind of turned it to its rough shape this is not exactly what it's gonna look like when it's done the outside diameter is roughly a 16th inch larger than what I actually want um, and the top as well and I haven't hollowed it out yet um, there's a reason for that um, and all I did was just turn it on the lathe I um, I filmed me turning it on the lathe, but then when I looked at it, the, the footage was really shaky. So it's kind of pointless to um, kind of put that into the video. I think most of you know how to turn a piece, and uh, you're probably not going to um, turn exactly what I'm turning. So what's really important about this is that you do not turn the piece to your exact dimensions. You want to leave the outside dimensions... A minimum of a sixteenth of an inch larger than what you want what you want for your finished piece in my case um, this is a sixteenth of an inch but in many cases it might even be better to go a full eighth of an inch and the reason why is because when you're drilling these holes the surface of the hole sometimes is not right uh, it's not perfect um, and you'll see when I go to drill them what I'm talking about sometimes they wander a little bit um, so you want to make sure that you have enough outside material to cut it down t below where all that um where all that mayhem is going on up here if that makes any sense so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and um start drilling some holes in this i'm going to show you some different ways to do it um and then we'll kind of move on from there all right, so we're back at the drill press and I've got my piece and we're gonna to start to drill the holes that are gonna create the chain link around this piece here. And I kind of have an idea in my mind where I wanna start and where I wanna end up. See, I have a, it's hard to see in this cause I've got a light up here just shining down. So it's kind of creating a glare, but I've got a little bit of burl running through here, a little bit here, a little bit down here. And right here I have a blank spot. So I want to start my chain down around here and I want to come around up over the top and end up in this blank spot on both sides. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my holes down here. I don't have, you can draw with the pencil the rough line that you want to follow um, if that works better for you. I'm just going to kind of eyeball it. Now what's really important about drilling these holes 
is that you want to go straight into the piece. Um, let's just say this is your hole saw. Wherever I keep bumping into my camera because I've got like a small space here, so uh, sorry about that. But anyways, so let's just say you want to drill your first hole down here at this point. What you want to do is you want to make sure that your drill bit is coming at a 90 degree through the wall of your piece. You don't want to be at an angle either way or like this. You want to be directly at 90 degrees. And as you turn it, you want to try and stay at 90 degrees. I ran into this problem on the neck with my um, Wenge piece. On the body of it, it wasn't quite as bad, but on the neck, it's kind of, you can see it if you know what you're looking for. It's really important because if you're coming through at an angle like this, instead of straight, when you go to hollow out the inside, um, even if your wall is say a quarter of an inch thick, that ring won't connect on the inside because, well it might if you drill down in far enough, it might actually connect in there. But I ran into that problem on the neck of my piece. So to try and save you a little bit of hassle, just try and make sure that you, when you're drilling, you're drilling at a 90 degree into your piece and you're going to kind of learn that as you go. Now. The, what's also important is you do not want to start connecting your pieces yet. You're gonna, you're gonna drill. I'm gonna go ahead and drill my first hole and my second hole, and my third hole, and you're gonna see me do it. And then I'm gonna kind of explain what I'm doing there. Um, so let's go ahead and drill some holes quick. And if I bump into the camera, I'm sorry. I'm doing my best here. I've just got like a really tight space. I'm actually gonna readjust my light real quick. And then we're going to get to it. And I usually keep several blocks of wood because if I want to drill it an angle, say like this or lower, I can just quickly adjust. I mean, like I've got rough blocks of wood laying around everywhere so I can adjust the height of my of my um, my bed, bed here without cranking it every single time. And sometimes I don't even use the bed. Sometimes I'll just take my piece, just with my hands as you can see, and I'll jam it up into the bit. Because, you know, you can clamp it down for every single cut if you want. Um, I actually had started doing that because I thought I was gonna have a lot of wander with this. And then I realized, you know, for some cuts, you can just push that piece right up into there and make your cut. And it's fine, it's a lot easier if you've got a bed for it to press down on, but you can literally just shove that piece in there and make that cut. Um, and a lot of times I'll just hold it in my fist, as you can see, and my fist kind of acts as the clamp, and I can kind of slowly start my cut and then work my way down into it. But in this piece, I think I will be just fine starting, um, starting where I'm at. So let's go ahead and get started. I guess I got to make sure my bit is sitting in there straight first. Make sure it's tightened down properly. Sorry, this is like, um, this drill press is like 30 years old. Um, a lot of you will notice that I don't always use that in most of the cases, I don't use any fancy tools for what I'm doing. Um, I can upgrade my, my drill press whenever I want. I can upgrade my lathe whenever I want, but I kind of have this mentality where I actually want to do it on um, less than ideal tools because I want people to understand that you do not need the biggest, best, fanciest tools in order to create amazing pieces of woodwork. Um, yes, the bigger, better tools are nice. I have a lot of really nice, big tools that do awesome jobs, but I think that people get overwhelmed. They see people turning these amazing projects and they think maybe I, I need a $5,000 lathe and a, all this and that. You don't. I can literally make this piece 100% on a drill press without a lathe if I wanted to. Um, it's all about ingenuity, 
how far you want to go with it and thinking outside of the box. So let's go ahead and get to drilling these things and see where we can go. I don't know if you can see it, but you can tell like right there at the tip of my thumb where going in the bit was a little bit wobbly. That right there is a perfect example of why you absolutely want your piece to be slightly oversized. Because when you cut it to the actual size, you're going to get rid of all that um, weirdness there where it was a little wobbly going in. So let me drill a couple more holes and then I'll explain exactly why I'm doing it in the way that I'm doing it. with three holes now I could go ahead and drill I don't know 10 or 15 holes at a time um, I'm not going to go through all that effort quite yet uh, maybe I will I don't know I'll give it a, I'll give it a second to think about it but anyways you don't want to intersect your rings yet you want to kind of figure out what pattern you're going to go in and you want to make sure that you're setting these far enough apart to where you can intersect them with another ring um, if they're too far apart, they're not going to intersect correctly. If they're too close together, you're also going to run into problems. It's really hard to see what actually happened there. But as I drilled this hole, this hole I, this hole I didn't have the problem with. But with this hole, this one actually intersects with this one down inside of the piece. In other words, this hole, so this hole right here crosses through this hole deeper down inside of there. I'm going to say maybe about a half an inch down. It intersected because I could see the dust starting to come out of the ring or you'll see smoke start to come out of this ring when you're drilling this one and then you'll you know that they intersected down in there now that's not a big deal at all it's going to happen um, what what you have to kind of do is I usually keep a pencil and I will mark uh, I'll put just like a little X there and that way I know that these two kind of intersect and you know I mean I, I'm pretty good with my memory so most of the time I can remember that they intersected and uh, we're gonna come back to that in a minute 
Um, but I'm, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and drill a few more holes. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll drill maybe sometimes between on the on the um, the wind gave ace what I did was I was drilling eight holes at a time so that I could kind of map slowly map out um, where I wanted it to go so I could visually kind of um, see it because I didn't draw a pencil line around there but if you drew a pencil line on there of kind of roughly where you wanted it to go it might save you a little bit of time so um, I'm gonna go ahead and pause this video I'm gonna drill some more holes and then we're going to start doing the veneer and I'll explain a few more things as well. So I'm going to pause right here. Okay, so we're all set up to start doing the veneer now. I went ahead and I cut, um, I think, 10 holes into this thing, uh, kind of following the pattern um, that I want to do here. And when I first did this, getting the veneer into the holes that I cut, was probably uh, one of the bigger challenges. I mean, figuring out how to make the hole saw and all that, um, it's kind of one of those things where it's actually, if you know what you're looking for, it's actually kind of easy. But figuring out how to get a piece of wood bent around and into a hole like that, it took a little bit of work, a little bit of a... Uh, process of elimination on um, the actual process so what I did was I went down to the local hardware store and I picked up some brass tubing and uh, that brass tubing comes in a packet like this I just bought this at Ace um, you can probably get it at Home Depot or any hobby store I see it all over the place but what I was looking for was a piece of brass tubing, let me get that, all that dirt out of there real quick, sorry about that guys. Um, what I was looking for was a piece of brass tubing that my whole saw would fit into um, perfectly. And this one is exactly a half inch diameter on the inside. Um, so as you can see my whole saw fits in there perfectly. And uh, what I did, I'm going to hold it up to the camera and see if I can get it to focus, is I cut a piece three quarters of an inch long off of the brass tube, and then I back beveled the inside edge of it. Okay. And the reason why I'm going with this method is because I actually tried um, wetting the veneer, like with steam and with just regular water. And the issue that you run into there is that the, um, the hole that is cut in here is so close to the thickness of the veneer that once you get the veneer wet it swells up and it no longer fits in the hole and um, you can go with a thicker walled hole saw but then you run into a couple of other issues if you wet your veneer and put it in there you can't put your glue in there really well the, the, I'm going to use CA glue to, to set these pieces. I guess you could use wood glue but as it dries out it's going to shrink and the veneer is going to pull away from itself. So you're going to end up with a little gap um, on every single one of these rings which you want to try and avoid. I ended up with a couple of them on the Wenge piece if you look really closely at it. Sorry this camera's not focusing as well as I want it to. But um, so I wanted, so I want to do the bending of the veneer dry, which is a challenge. I'm just dropping everything here, sorry. Um, so in order to bend the veneer dry, the first thing that you have to do is cut the strips out properly. This piece of veneer here, I've kind of marked the grain. You can see it's running this way. And I cut my strips one inch wide and it's perpendicular to the grain. And the reason why I think most people already know is that it's much more flexible when you cut the piece perpendicular to the grain versus with the grain. You can see that this doesn't want to flex that much. That's about all I can get out of it versus this way. It actually flexes fairly easy, but not enough to go down to that diameter. So what I figured out with um, playing around with it is if I use a, um, a smaller diameter um, tube or this can be a wooden dowel this can be anything but I'll try and show you the difference in size between the two see if I can get this in here focused 
you see the size difference between the inside piece and the outside piece there? Um, you don't want them to be too close in size. That would be a problem. And what this tube does is it allows me to bend the veneer without breaking it. I'm going to try and do this on camera. It's actually, I think I can get the point across even if I can't successfully show the whole thing on camera. I think you'll understand what I'm doing here. But I'm going to try and get the whole thing on camera. So if you have a backer on that veneer, which is what I have here, I actually just broke that piece. So you can see this is doing this dry is actually kind of difficult, but it's once you get used to it, it's actually not so bad. So using this thinner tube, what I want to do is kind of loosen this grain up. And how I'm going to do that is I'm just rocking this piece of veneer back and forth slowly and slowly bending it as I go. And it's slowly kind of loosening up. And actually, this goes a lot quicker once you get used to it. I broke another piece because I'm more focused on the camera than I am anything else. So let's see if we can do this again. I actually, this is weird. I mean, I, I don't break this many pieces. That might sound kind of crazy, but I, I usually, it, it, when I first started, I broke a lot of pieces. But once I kind of figured it out, it wasn't so bad after that. So anyways, I'm going to slowly bend this piece around here. And what's happening is the, the brass tube is providing support to the veneer. And if you were to pull that brass tube away from the veneer, that's when you'll get a crack in it. So just make sure your veneer is, is snug. See, if, if I were to pull it like that, there's a good chance that I would probably break it. You want to keep the veneer tight to that brass tube. And I just rock it back and forth a little bit like this, and you'll feel the grain kind of loosening up as you do that. So once you've loosened, and you can see now it's kind of actually even holding its shape a little bit. So once you've loosened the grain up quite a bit, and you can see it didn't really take that long, you want to try and get your ends fairly close to each other, just like that. And you're going to take your half inch piece, and you're going to kind of go over the end of it like this, and slowly fit it on there, and then slide, slide your center piece out, and then you're going to slowly press your veneer piece into this brass tube, just like that. Okay. And again, when you first try this, it's not going to be easy. But the more you do it, the more practice you have with this, the easier it's going to get. But you can now see that I've got my piece of veneer inside of my metal ring. So what I'm going to do is um, show you how to go from here to there. I think most of you can already see where I'm going with this. Um, but I'm going to try and get this camera to focus a little bit better. So I'm going to pause it for a quick second and then we'll come right back. Okay, so I messed with the camera a little bit. I don't know if it's going to be any better with focusing or not. But anyway, so I've got my piece of veneer inside of my brass ring. And... Um, as you can see, it's sitting in there pretty nice. And um, I think most of you can see where I'm going with this. What I'm going to do now is take my, my veneer with my brass ring. And you can see the veneer sticking out past the, bra the brass ring here. And I should be able to um, fit it into any of these holes because they're all exactly the same size. And uh, boom, there it goes. It's in. And uh, that's how I get my veneer inside of the hole there. Now you have the issue of getting the brass ring off um, and leaving the veneer inside of it. So um, usually what I'll do is I, I can take a piece of uh, tubing or um, you can actually get a, um, which I don't have here with me, I don't know why, you can get a half inch dowel, uh, which is the same diameter as this, and just kind of Put it on top and push the brass ring up over it, which I might be able to do just with this um, with this hole saw here. See if I can pull it off. There we go. Just like that. It was actually a lot easier than I thought. And then you can push the veneer the rest of the way in. And it's set. Now, up here it looks really kind of... It's hard to see on the video. And up here at the top it looks kind of weird. It's like weird shaped and whatever. 
but down down in here it's not um, it can only fit in where the cut is so down inside of this piece it is it's perfectly round and it fits in there perfectly so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and set the other pieces of veneer I'm gonna use the same process if you have any questions about this process just ask below um, so let me go ahead and set these and then I'll come back to you guys and we'll talk about the next step so I spent a little bit of time getting uh, my inlay my uh, veneer pieces into the grooves it took me about I don't know, half an hour to get all of these pieces in here and you're going to notice that I left two of them out. The reason why those two are not, um, don't have the veneer in them yet, is because these two holes intersect with this hole down inside of the piece. So if I put a piece of veneer in here, it's going to hit the veneer and stop short of the, bay, the bottom of the cut. Same on this side. So what I have to do is I actually have to glue all of these pieces into place and then I have to go back to the drill press, drill through these two holes again, and then I can insert my piece of veneer. Now how I glue these in is I use um, a really thin um, super glue or CA glue if that's what you want to call it. Um, so. Ah. Sorry about that. I'm trying to switch hands here. So basically what I do is I take my thin CA glue and I just put it, I'm kind of doing this one handed because I'm holding the camera with uh, the other hand because um, it's kind of hard to have this on a tripod. I need to be able to move around so um, excuse all the uh, jumbleness there. So what I do is I take my thin super glue and I put a couple drops on the inside and I want to watch the glue. I want to make sure it's soaking down into the into the um, into the cut there. And I can actually watch it kind of disappear down into the um, down into the piece. And I want to keep going until it stops absorbing the glue. Now the problem that I have with this particular piece is because these two intersect with this, that glue is actually running down inside of these two rings deep down in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of hit it with the um, accelerator and hopefully set off the glue down in there, which will stop it from bleeding into these two holes. I hope what I'm saying is kind of making sense. I don't. Sometimes I don't know if I'm explaining these things quite right. So now that I've kind of hit that with the accelerator, I'll try and finish filling this hole in. I'll hit it with the accelerator again because I don't. I think it's um, still kind of going down in. Let's see what we got. Okay, now you can see that the glue cut stopped seeping down in, and now it has set up in there. Give it another little squirt. Um, we'll hold it up and try and get a good look at it, try and get it in the light. So you can see the glue quit soaking, soaking down there, but you can actually see where the glue kind of ran out of this one just a little bit there. But now that this one is glued in place, I'm going to go back to the um, drill press. I'm going to finish cutting through these two. And then I'm going to um, put the veneer in here. And then I'll go ahead and glue them all in place exactly the same way that I did this one. After I get done with all of that, we'll come back and we'll talk about the next step. All right, so um, I went ahead and took it to the drill press. I um, reamed out the holes where they um, kind of crossed over each other and uh, this is the end result everything is glued in I just put a puddle of CA glue in the center of each let it soak in for a little while and then hit it with some hardener 
and uh, then I kind of went and made sure I had some glue on the outside of each ring. Now, before you move on to cutting more rings, you want to kind of clean these up because these are obviously in the way at the moment. And um, the first time I did this, I just chucked it in the lathe and uh, tried to smooth it off with a grind with a um, with a skew, and uh, it just kind of made a mess of everything. So I came to the conclusion that using I, I'm using a grinder with a stiff backer pad. And uh, I think this is um, 120 grit. And it makes short work of grinding these down. Now you don't want to actually hit the surface of your workpiece. Just take it down real close. And then put it back in the lathe and touch it up. So I'm not going to film me sanding these off. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But I am going to sand it, put it in the lathe. And I'm gonna, I'll am gonna probably film me um, kind of touching it up a little bit. And then we'll move on to the next step. So I sanded down the, um, the excess, and you can see I just took it down just to the surface and didn't quite hit the surface. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of my um, scrapers, and I'm going to just kind of take it down a little bit further. Now I don't want to remove any material from the surface. I just want to get these down kind of close so that I can see them better. Um, and that's so that when I go to drill the next holes, I don't have any interference and I can properly line them up. So I'm just going to go ahead and touch this up real quick and then we'll take a closer look at it. Try not to hit the camera here. Let's take a look at it. As you can see, most of my glue lines are still on there, but my rings are pretty even to the surface now. They're not really going to interfere with anything. Let me pick the camera up and get a little bit closer look at it. Okay, so like I said, you can see I've kind of taken them down really flush to the surface. And the glue that's still on here doesn't matter because, again, remember this is slightly oversized. Um, as to what the finish dimensions are going to be. So this glue is eventually going to get cleaned off of here. And let's take a little closer look at these rings. And if you've done them right, like you can see this one here, there's a slight break in the ring right there. But you see a little bit of a break in the ring there. This one's actually perfect. You can't see a break in the ring at all. Same with this one. Uh, this one you can see it there a little bit, but um, There's another one there so you can always see where the break is just slightly and if you do it right when you drill the other hole you can kind of put um, The hole through that break. I don't know if I can do it with these or not. We'll find out when we get to that point but now what we can do is we can go back and we can drill the connecting rings and uh, fill them in so I'm probably going to do that tomorrow it's getting a little bit late I've been working on this most of the day um, but you can see uh, where we're at here and I think most of you are kind of starting to put two and two together on the process we're going to go ahead and follow it through I got a couple of uh, other interesting little things that I'm going to do with this uh, to make it stand out even more than it hopefully already will Okay, so um, at this stage I've already drilled the um, next set of holes. As you can see these holes, I've already started to kind of insert them. These holes connect all the other rings together. So when you're drilling your initial rings, you've got to be real careful 
on your spacing if you plan on connecting them like this. There's a lot of different other applications you can use this for, a lot of different patterns. But for this particular one, I want a chain that kind of connects together. So your spacing is important, and I just eyeballed it. Um, it's the same process for the second go around on these um, on these dots. You just drill your holes, and uh, then glue your veneer piece in. Uh, somebody asked me a question on Facebook um, on about whether or not you could kind of make the rings look like they um, like they go kind of over and under each other. And you can, but you're going to run into a lot of issues there. I tried that with um, with a sample piece. And what you have to do in order to kind of create that effect is you have to drill all of your holes first. And then you have to like run your veneer, it would say start here and come around and stop. And then your second piece, you would have to come around and stop. And then you would have another small piece in here, if that makes sense. The issue that you run into is, if you were to drill both of your, I'm going to just kind of come in here a little bit, if you were to drill all of your holes first, you've got these little tiny pieces right here at the tip of my finger, on this side of my finger, that would be freestanding in there. And uh, when I did the experiment, I had a problem with those things breaking off, because they're so small. Now, if you were doing larger rings, maybe one inch rings or three quarter inch rings, it might not be quite as bad, but it's still... You have to kind of weigh is it worth the amount of time and effort and with these lines being so fine um, when I did do it I wish I still had the piece sitting around here I don't um, when I did do it the effect was almost unnoticeable because of how thin my veneers are you would really have to look at it so um, yes you can make it look like the chain kind of stops and goes under you know like a, a real chain would but in my opinion, for me, especially for this application with how small they are, it's just not something that's worth the effort. So I'm going to go ahead and glue all these veneers in, and uh, then we're, I'll come back to you and we'll talk about it a little bit more. So I've got the latest set of rings glued in. There's a total of 12 of them. Um, as you can see, it kind of just looks like a jumbled up mess at the moment. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to sand these down to the wood. I'm going to try not to actually hit the piece that I'm working on with the sander. And then I'm just going to clean it up with the um, lathe a little bit, like in my earlier process. And uh, depending on how big the piece is and how many rings you have, you may have to go through that process several times. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. I don't think I need to film the whole thing because it's literally the same thing I did earlier. And... Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and do that, and then I'll come right back to you. So at this point, I have drilled all of my holes, and I'm ready to go down to my final um, outside dimension, or at least really close to it. Um, what you see here is I kind of went back and I filled any extra little pits um, with some thin CA glue. And uh, there's actually a little surprise on this piece. You'll see when I'm done turning it, it's actually on the other side. I decided to add a little bit extra to it. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, do the final scraping of this, see if I can do it without knocking my camera over. And then we'll take a closer look at it. So um, I couldn't really um, turn the top portion of it without hitting my camera, so I just did the side wall. I'm going to come in here closer and give you a look. Sorry about that jumbled camera. 
Now, I don't know exactly if uh, this is the exact shape that I'm going to go with him. I'm talking about fractions of an inch. I'm not sure how I feel about it yet. I might take a little more off the bottom, change this taper a little bit. I'll kind of figure that out in a minute. But, like I said, I wanted to add something a little bit extra to it. So here it comes. There it is. So, what I wanted to do was kind of make this look like it was almost a necklace or a chain and it was kind of had a pendant hanging off of it so it kind of if I can move my tripod here it wraps up over the top as you can see and it comes to a conclusion right here with this pendant and that's why I kind of left this space blank to begin with now you can do whatever you want this piece I had left over from a previous project that I did so I just figured it would be no big deal to um, throw it in on this project uh, so the next step to this obviously is going to be hollowing it out and getting all the um, final pieces done. Um, like I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna put a little rim on the top of it here. So when I'm ready to start hollowing it out, um, we'll come back and take a look at that. I don't know how much of the um, hollowing um, process I'm gonna actually film because it's probably gonna take a little while, being that this is so small. It's going to take a lot of delicate work, so I don't want like um, an hour's worth of me just slowly hollowing this thing out. I haven't done a lot of really small vases, that's why it's most likely why it's going to take me a little bit longer to actually hollow this thing out. So um, we'll see what it looks like in just a second. Okay, so at this point I've gone ahead and hollowed it out and um, it took me a little bit of time because the hole here is only about a half of an inch and I really didn't have the tools necessary to do it properly so it took me quite a bit of time I'm going to try and get try and show you the inside of this and it's kind of hard to see but all of the rings go all the way through the wall all the way you can even see if i can get a good look at it that the um there's a lot of dust in there but the um the pendant pattern see if that'll help the pendant pattern goes all the way through as well there's dust laying on it so it's hard to see the whole thing and that took some time so um what i'm gonna do now is I'm actually going to glue a little lip here to kind of create a little bit more of um, a finished product and down here I'm going to cut a, um, a little tenon because I'm thinking about doing a, um, a base for it. I haven't 100% decided on that yet. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do the neck piece first and then decide on this so I'm going to have a little bit of time to think about it. But uh, this is um, pretty good progress so far. That light makes it kind of hard to see everything that's going on. Um, so we'll come back to this in just a minute. So at this point it's all sanded down. I started with 220 grit and I went down to 600 grit. And you can see it's already got a nice semi-gloss sheen on it and that's because the maple is uh, stabilized with a resin. Uh, I could probably just hit it with some wax, some sort of an abrasive wax and be fine with it but I'm gonna not go that route. I'm gonna actually do 
a um, a typical bottle stopper finish, I guess, is the only way I can describe it, which is just going to be some thin CA glue. I'm going to rub it on with a paper towel, and then I'm going to sand it and buff it. Um, if this wood was not stabilized, I would not be doing a CA finish on it. Um, I kind of only trust the CA with the uh, stabilized wood, like in this case, because the expansion and contraction is going to be minimal. The issue that you run into with um, with CA glue is that it's a very hard finish, and it has um, sorry, put my finger in the way. It has very little flexibility to it. So what ends up happening is when wood expands, it contracts. Where you have all these little joints um, anywhere in here, uh, the glue can will actually the CA glue will actually. Uh, in many cases crack and you'll end up with like a white line running around it because um, the wood the, the finish doesn't flex with the wood uh, like um, if you were gonna compare it to anything it would be like a car finish um, metal expands and contracts so if you spray paint a clear coat on a on a car and the the finish isn't specifically designed to move in and out with the expansion and contraction of the metal on the car. It's just going to end up peeling off the car eventually, and that has happened in many cases. So you have to be real careful with what type of finishes that you use. Um, there's not really one finish that's great for everything. It kind of depends on the situation that you're in and what you're doing. Again, because this is all stabilized wood, I don't expect a lot of expansion and contraction. I don't expect a lot of movement. What I did on the inside of the vase was I used in a, a two-part epoxy that's made by a company called The Rot Doctor. And it's, in a, it's a penetrating epoxy. It's a two-part. It, the issue with that is it does yellow. But on the inside of the vase, you're never going to see it. So I, I poured it in there, I sloshed it around, I did like two coats, and then I let it set up. Then uh, I kind of cleaned up the outside, and now I'm going to do the CA finish. So um, it's real. It's a real simple process. I'm just going to use a paper towel, wipe it on, do several coats. Then I'm going to sand it down to 600 and buff it. Uh, I don't. I, I might film the process, I might not. There's a lot of information out there on, on doing that, so I don't know if that's really, it's kind of a waste of time to add that into this video since there's so much information on it already. The only thing that I would, um, I'm going to go back again and, and just repeat what I said. If your wood is not stabilized and you've got a lot of inlay work in it, I, I really don't recommend using CA glue for a finish. If I get time, I'll show you a piece that I did early on, probably about four years ago, where I used um, a CA finish, and four years later, today it's sitting on my, my uh, TV stand, and you can see where every joint is start, the CA glue is separating and cracking. And uh, I kind of knew that early on, so this isn't typical. I, I only use this finish um, on stabilized woods. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and do that, and then we're going to come back and take a look at it. All right, so um, this is probably eight coats of um, thin CA glue. I sanded it with uh, nothing more coarse than 600 grit. I went down to a 3,000 grit. And then I just buffed it out with a um, car polishing compound. You can see the reflections pretty good on this one. Um, so what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to cut it off. And I'm going to leave the tenon on there because I'm making a base for this. I'm also going to make a finial for it. I don't know how I feel about the finial yet. I may or may not leave that with the piece. Um, we'll see where it goes. So at this point, I'm actually done with the with the finish and the polish on this thing, and I'm going to move on to the next step, which is the base. I made the decision not to add the footage of me turning the base into this video because uh, the video is already kind of long as it is, and I figured that uh, 
the bulk of the video is really about the inlay work and not the um, not like the base and the overall piece, but more about um, getting the inlays done properly. I'll give you a quick look at the base here. I just wanted to add a little bit of a foot to it, kind of make it stable when it's standing on its own. And I didn't want to kind of overdo it. I think it came out pretty good with the um, with the ebony on the top and the bottom kind of tying it all together. And uh, I didn't shoot the video of me turning the finial either. Um, I, I, I filmed it, but I just decided not to add that footage into this again because the video is already kind of long and it's not really about turning a finial or a base it was about the inlay work but um this piece can be shown with or without the finial in it i just kind of decided as an afterthought to make the uh, finial to also act as a cap for the piece uh, some people like it some people don't i really don't know how i feel entirely about it but the piece can kind of um, stand on its own as it is. Uh, so uh, if you like this video, let me know. Please like and sub subscribe to my channel. Uh, and I've got a lot more videos to come in the future. Uh, so thanks for watching. And uh, go ahead and give it a shot. See what happens.